Okay, welcome. Uh, this is Effects as Data. I'm Richard Feldman. Um, so I want to start by talking about a project I worked on a couple years ago. And this was essentially uh, something that let people post resumes to apply for jobs. So the uh, business requirements of this job posting system. So the user would read the job posting. They would upload their resume. The resume would get stored on a static file server. Then we would parse the contact info out of that to save time for our end users who would be reviewing these resumes. So they didn't want to have to go in and copy paste out the email address and all that stuff. So the implementation of this, we would receive the uploaded resume, we would store it on Amazon S3 in its raw form so that they could download it later, and we'd parse the contact info out for them. So to do this, we had to deal with a bunch of different file formats because people who are applying for jobs don't care about our lives, they just care about formatting their resume however they want. So they'd use .doc, .docx, PDF, HTML, all sorts of different fun file formats. So we had a couple of different steps here. Uh, first, we had to convert them into a string. So we'd use PDF to HTML, which was this process that would take PDFs and intuitively convert them to HTML. Uh, we'd use JSTOM to get from HTML to various strings. And we'd use a headless LibreOffice process to convert from doc and docx and all these other ancient Microsoft formats into strings. Uh, and then finally, once we had the strings, we would parse them using Node.js. That was our back end. OK, so convert was doing file I.O. So taking in the uploaded resumes and storing them in various places, HTTP communication to send them off to S3, and process management to deal with headless LibreOffice and all these other things. In the parse phase, we were just doing tokenizing, fuzzy matching, regular expressions, pretty standard string stuff. So testing is good. I think we can probably agree on that. Um, raise your hand if you think testing is good. All right, I think we have consensus on that point. Um, here's another question. Has anyone ever had one of these? An unrealistic deadline. Raise your hand if you've ever had an unrealistic deadline. <laughs> All right, so we have consensus on that as well. You can probably see where I'm going with this. Um, you don't need to raise your hand, but just think in your head if you've ever had an unrealistic deadline and you've cut some corners, and the area where you cut corners was in testing. <laughs> Guilty. Um, so this was one of those projects. Uh, we, we were under the gun and we cut corners on testing. And um, specifically, we cut corners on testing in the convert pipeline. Actually, we cut the entire corner. Um, we didn't test it at all. Uh, we went to production with that being totally untested. All of that file IO, HTTP stuff, process management, no tests around any of it. Guess where all the problems were when it got to production, where all the production fires were? Um, yeah, it was in that stuff. Uh, so why did we do that? Why did we walk into that? Why did we fail to test any of that stuff? Well, if we look at what those two different things were doing, so convert was doing file I.O., HTTP, and process management, whereas the parsing stuff, which was much easier to test, obviously, because that was what we reached for, um, that was just converting strings into other strings. So another way of thinking of this is that Convert was running lots of effects, and parse was just transforming data. So effects are interactions with external state. So you have a function that uh, deals with external state as a stateful function. So effectful functions are stateful functions. The opposite of that is a stateless function. So stateless functions just look at their arguments and return a value, also known as pure functions or referential transparency. So if you give them the same arguments, they give you the same results, have no side effects. There's no interaction either reading from or writing to external state. They're completely independent. So stateless tests are really easy, right? You set up the arguments, you call the function with those arguments, and you check the result, the return value. That's all there is to it. Stateful tests, you have to set up the starting state, and then call the function, and then check the final state. But if you think about it, it basically just said the same thing twice, right? In general, we can generalize this to tests are just set up and then run and then check the result. So why is it easier to write stateless tests if we're just doing the same conceptual thing three times? What is the implementation detail that makes us cut the entire corner off this one class of tests and feel that the other class of tests are easy to write? Let's take a look at potential implementations of certain parts of this pipeline. So this is one way we can implement uh, parse. This is a function, parse resume. It takes in a string, 
does a bunch of stuff, and then returns contact info. And then let's look at just one portion of the effectful side of this, uh, specifically the portion that takes the resume and saves it on Amazon S3. So this would be a, a store portion of that. So function store resume, it's gonna take in a file object, and it's gonna take in a callback, because this is Node, Node likes callbacks. We're gonna call post to S3, which is a function we're assuming exists, and, uh, and it takes, the first argument is a path, which we'll put it in the resumes folder and plus file.name. Second argument is gonna, it's gonna take the data, the raw binary data of that file, and then it's gonna take a callback, which will give us back a response. So in the middle logic there is handling that response. So if response.status is 200, that means everything was good. S3 said, yep, we stored it successfully. We're gonna call our callback and continue. Otherwise, we're gonna log an error that said we failed to save that particular file. Okay, so testing parse, we're gonna just do that stuff we said earlier. This is a Mocha style test, so we say describe parsing a resume. It can identify an address. We will set up our arguments. Let's assume that we have example being some sort of uh, example resume that we're gonna pass in the parse resume. Um, that's a string, and then we get back this contact info object, and then the, we just assert the address it looks right on that contact info object. Uh, the other test, so let's say we want to do identify a phone number. Same thing, just contact info equals parse resume, passing a different set of example data, and then make an assertion about contact info. What about that store function? Um, so let's say we want to just test that it succeeds if you get a status 200 back, and that it logs an error if you get a 500 back. How do we do that? Well, if we look at our implementation here, um, we've got a problem, which is that we don't have access to that middle function there, that callback. We've got this function that takes a response, and that's what we want to pass in. That's what we want to change, is we want to give it a different response in each of those different test cases. But we don't have ac access to that right now. That's something that we get back from S3. So how do we fix that? Okay, that's a pretty simple refactor. We just split it up. We make two functions. So you have a function called store resume. You have a different function called handle response. And now we can test handle response separately. So we've just taken the same logic. It's doing the same stuff. It's just we've reorganized it into two functions instead of one to make it more testable. Okay, cool. So now we can describe storing a resume and say it succeeds for status 200. And now we're calling handle response, passing status 200. We get back a result. We test that. Logs an error for 500. Call handle response. Look at the result. The test goes here. All good. Well, or is it? So what, what is the value of results here? Um, well, nothing, because handle response doesn't return anything. So we're, we've split it up, we've now isolated this thing, now the arguments part is fine, we can now pass stuff into this in our test cases, but we still don't have a return value to work with. So we've got the part where we set it up, but the other part, the check, we still don't have anything for that. This is uh, annoying, it's, it's sort of a, a hostile API, right? Um, we want to just do what we did in the first place. We just call the thing and then look at what we got back. Why can't we do that? Well, um, we can do that using mocks. So mocks inject a more testable API into something that sort of intrinsically has a hostile one. And mocks are d the best. Everybody loves mocks. I mean, I think about writing a stateless test and just passing in arguments looking at the result, and then I think about <laughs> writing mocks, and I have the same feelings about both of those. Yeah, <laughs> it's starting to become apparent how we could have skipped this entire category of tests somehow. Um, so here's a novel idea. What if we just had a testable API to begin with? What if we just made it so that all of our business logic was in stateless functions and we could have just written the nice kind of test the entire time through? Maybe we would have had a different experience and production would have been, I'm gonna say, less on fire uh, when we launched. So Flux has some interesting things to say about this, the same way as Redux does, the same way as the Elm architecture does. Um, you have these actions, right? So an action is a value that describes an effect. It's not an effect itself, obviously this is just data, um, but it's still describing the idea of what we want done. We're saying the action type is post to S3. You've got a name, which is file.name, path, which is the resumes thing we put together, and then the data being the file's data. So we can write our store resume function in terms of this, still taking a file, but now instead of taking a callback, we're returning something. We're returning this description of what we want done. Okay, and then handle response, similarly, can take a name and a response, and then instead of making a callback, it can just return another action. 
And this one's going to return a different action depending on the status code. So this is our business logic determining which effect we want done next. So if the status code is 200, we're going to return a saved success action. And if it's not 200, we're going to return a log error action with the appropriate message wrapped up in it. Either way, we're going to return another action. So essentially, this is the idea of representing effects as data. We're just passing action objects instead of doing the thing immediately. OK, but of course, we can't just stop there. We can't just have functions that just return stuff, and then we don't do anything with them. Because if we did that, then we would not have any kind of production environment. We would just be passing a bunch of data around. It would all be very testable and would do nothing. So we actually need to do it. Um, so we'll make this third function called run action. So run action will take the action, and we will do a switch statement on action.action .action type. And then depending on which of those four action types we've got, so post S3, handle response, log error, and save success, we will take the appropriate action. We will actually run the effect. So for post to S3, when we get one of those as our action type, we're going to call that post to S3 function that we used to be calling directly from our business logic function. So we call it passing action.path, action.data, which again were constructed in our business logic function. And then we're going to do the callback, which is going to call run action again, passing that action type. So again, we're just no business logic in here whatsoever. All we're doing is handling these actions and translating them into actual effects that get run. Similarly, we can do the same thing with handle response. So this is the one that actually forks and does two different actions depending on business logic. So say next action equals, then handle response, and we take action.name, action.response, and that's going to give us back one of two new actions, depending on whether we got a 200 or not from S3. Doesn't matter which one. Again, this has no knowledge of the business logic. It's just going to take whatever it gets back from handle response and call run action again to keep going. Okay, so to sum up, version one of this function, we had store resume, it just did chain callbacks right there, just sort of the most straightforward implementation we could think of, very difficult to test. Version two, easier to test in the sense of handling respo handle response being something we could actually call directly so we could pass arguments into it, so these isolated callbacks let us do that. And then version three was the third refactor, where we split these out and made it so that both of those business logic functions were stateless and just returning an action object. And then we made this run action function that actually turned those into effects. So we're done, right? Mission accomplished. We've successfully turned our business logic stuff into stateless functions. They're now easy to test, and we can all go home. Well, not quite. So the effect wiring still needs testing, right? Um, we can still potentially make errors there. But at least now we can have one mock to test them all. So if we go back and we look at our run action, here's an example of one thing that could go wrong here. If I were to change how this worked, and I say, I have a new business logic requirement where I want to actually pass through the size of the file that I'm uploading. So one reason I might want to do this is, let's say that it goes to Amazon and it comes back with an error message. And it says, hey, I couldn't store this for you. But for some reason, Amazon's API doesn't tell us what the reason was. That's kind of annoying, and we're trying to diagnose why this might be. So we want to pass the file size through because we know one of the things that could go wrong is that we could get a sort of excessive size error. So we want to pass that through. Well, if we're doing these two business logic uh, functions as stateless functions, when we're testing them, we're passing in dummy data. We're assuming that everything went through properly. But it's entirely possible that in the store resume part, we could fail to pass through the correct size attribute from that file object. But then on the other side, we would never know that it didn't get there, because in our test, we would be passing it through, assuming that the wiring had done it properly. So we could have an error in this wiring that breaks everything, even though those two other functions are tested properly. But fortunately, now we can do one mock to test them all and just only have to mock this one function. So in summary, Testing tactics we've gone through so far. One, split out stateless functions into multiple functions so we can pass things into each of them rather than having chained callbacks. Two, isolate all the effects in one place, so that one run action, and so we can mock everything in there. And three, what we're mocking now is just simple wiring, not business logic. Our business logic is now nice and easy to test, and our mocking is all confined to just this wiring. OK, so we've got these nice stateless functions, right? What if state sneaks back in? The thing that makes these tests nice is that we can just pass in data and know that if uh, we get a return value, then that's not going to change, right? It's just data in, data out. Okay, 
So here's a stateless function. Count resumes. Takes in an array of resumes. It just returns resumes.length. I am pretty confident this is stateless because all it's doing is reading the length attribute and returning it. Cool. Okay. This is also stateless. Count usable resumes. Let's say we get an array of all resumes and then also an array of broken resumes that are malformatted somehow. We can't parse them. We don't know what the file format is, whatever the reason. Count usable says all.length minus broken.length. Definitely also stateless. Okay. And even if we compose those two together, we implement count usable in terms of count resumes, just passing in all, um, still very stateless. This is not stateless. We made one modification here. Now count resumes is taking in its resumes array and then just totally ignoring it and just blowing it away with whatever's in local storage.resumes. Thanks. Um, that's annoying and that's gonna break our count resumes function, but it's also gonna break our count usable function because that function is calling out to count resumes. So now, whereas previously we had two stateless functions, now it turns out we've got two stateful functions. They're both relying on the current state of local storage at the time that you call them to determine what they return. This reminds me of the colorful metaphor. If you take a barrel full of water, and you just had just one drop of urine, now you have a barrel of urine water. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on here. Um, all it takes is one. Previously, you could rely, rely on these functions. You could write your test under the assumption that if you call each of them, passing the same arguments, you're going to get the same return value. But now you're not anymore, because just one of them in the chain polluted all the others with this state. That's annoying. OK, but there's a silver lining here, which is that if we tested both of these functions, right? we tested count usable and we tested count resumes, this is going to break. Because when we were pass testing count resumes, we were passing in a value for resumes. And then it used to just return resumes.length, but now it's looking at local storage. And since we wouldn't have set up local storage for that test, the test would fail, right? So test caught it. We're good. We're glad we wrote that test. Now we're definitely covered. We can definitely go home. OK, what about this? So this is another way you could have state sneak in. What if count resumes calls resumes.pop? So it actually mutates the thing that it takes in like a jerk. And then it returns resumes.length plus one to cover up for it. I know that nobody in this room has ever done a hack and then covered it up to make it look like it was still working the way it used to. I certainly have never done that in my career. OK, so let's say it's doing this. Now again, we've had state sneak back in, but this is more pernicious because our test that's passing in resumes is not going to fail unless we specifically happen to pass in empty array, right? Empty array will break. If we had a test covering this, we pass in the empty array, it tries to pop nothing off of there, then it returns length plus one, now that's the wrong length. But all other cases, it's gonna pass. So hopefully we did that test, hopefully we had one passing empty array. So we dodged a bullet again. Okay. But, but would a test have caught that? I mean, like, realistically, maybe if we were using quick check, but okay, never mind, let's, let's, let's move on. All right, what about this one? Okay, so surely this must be stateless, right? I mean, we just got, I guess I spoiled it with the caption, but um, so we've got, a, we've got a variable outside called extras, right? We're closing over it. So count usable is now doing all.length, which we know is stateless, broken.length, which we also know is stateless, and then it's adding in extras.length. But of course, we all know that extras can be mutated, right? Uh, at any point in the course of our program's execution, somebody could be pop, uh, pushing stuff onto extras, popping stuff off of it. Count usable could return a completely different value every time we call it. Um, and this is even more pernicious than the previous two because all of the tests for this will work, right? Unless the tests go out of their way to mutate extras, every single time you call count usable in a test situation, passing the same two arguments, you're going to get the same result. It appears to be stateless. When you're going to encounter this is when you have production error logs that don't make any sense, and you're having conversations with people like, this isn't possible, this couldn't be happening, I have tests that prove this is not happening, and then someone says, it is happening, it's broken, I've got these people on the phone who are angry with me, you're like, no, it's not, oh. <laughs> so, okay. But, as I, one of my favorite lines from yesterday was, uh, Make const, not var. That's a great line from Julia Gao. Um, but uh, would that have saved us here if we used const instead of var? No. That can still get mutated. So const is better than var. Big proponent. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it doesn't fix the problem here. OK. Finally, we have the most pernicious one of all. This is where definitely all the tests will pass. But actually, it's just got a side effect. Right? So it doesn't actually impact its own value at all. It's going to return the same thing every single time. If you give it the same arguments, no possible way you could 
write your test in such a way that this is ever going to appear not stateless, except that it's, as a side effect, mutating external state. Man, this is the worst one of all because now you're wondering, who did that? Somebody modified resumes, who did that? And you're not gonna look at count usable, right? There's no chance that count usable would have done that. It's harmless, it's just counting stuff, or so we thought. Okay, how can we control this? How can we <laughs> stop the madness? Let me tell you about Elm. <laughs> <laughs> So Elm is all stateless functions, and it's all immutable values, and it's all const all the time. So here is count usable in Elm. Um, this is how you write functions in Elm. You put the arguments before the equal sign. So this is count usable, taking two arguments, all and broken. We're gonna call list.length on all, that's how you get the length of something in Elm, and subtract list.length of broken. So same implementation as before. All right, let's try and break it. So extras equals empty list. Count usable is now incorporating list.length extras. Well, this is dumb because extras is always a const, so it can never be reassigned, and it's immutable, so it can never be pushed to or popped from. So list.length extras will literally always be zero every single time you run this program. We've failed to break our thing. We've failed to introduce even a drop of urine into our lovely bucket of program. <laughs> Colorful metaphors. Um, Okay, good, that's good. So we can actually rely on this thing being stateless. Excellent. But now there comes the question, we don't have side effects, right? We have every function is stateless, but without side effects, how can we do stuff? We wanna do stuff. Earlier on, we had that last step of implementing run action, right? We made almost everything stateless. We made all of our business logic stateless, but we still needed that last little bit of effects, that last little push to get over the hump so that we could actually do something. How do we do that? Okay, so we're calling back in that world in JavaScript where we'd refactored things into this nice testable paradigm. We still had store resume taking a file returning an action, great. Handle response taking a string and a response returning an action, great. And then run action taking an action returning undefined. And that was the thing that actually did the effects. So in Elm, instead of having that re return undefined, you're gonna have it return a task. So a task is just a value that describes an effect you want done, kind of similarly to actions, except this is a first-class citizen in Elm that the Elm runtime will just translate automatically into effects for you. So it has similar characteristics to promises and callbacks. So like a callback, you can instantiate a task and it doesn't do anything right when you instantiate it. You can make 100 of these right in a row, nothing will happen, no network traffic, no local storage modification, nothing. It just describes what you want done. And like promises, they incorporate the notion of success and failure right there in the task. And they're composable like promises in the same consistent kind of way. Okay, so now, instead of this uh, last function taking an action and returning undefined, in Elm, everything else is the same, except we're taking an action and we're returning a task. That's how run action will be implemented in Elm. And now for something slightly different. So actions in Elm, uh, we don't represent as objects, we represent using union types. Union types at their simplest are just an enumeration. So we could say type bool equals true or false. So that's saying that bool is a custom type we've just invented out of thin air, and it's got either true or false. Those are the two sort of abstract values it can hold. This is also coincidentally literally how bool is implemented in Elm, which is why if you've ever seen Elm code and wondered why true and false are capitalized, it's because in union types all of the enumerated values are capitalized. And bool is just an unspecial one just like anything else. So we could use this to make an action with four different types, post to S3, handle response, log error, and save success. So these would correspond to when we were making these out of objects, we had an action type string. In Elm, we're gonna use a union type for this instead. Union types can be parameterized. So uh, we can incorporate not only the action type, but also the value that goes with it. So post to S3 needed to take a string for the name and the data. Handle response took a string for the name and a response object. Log error just took a string for the message and saved success didn't take anything at all. Okay, so now we can implement our action using a case expression, which is analogous to a switch statement in JavaScript. So we've got our action union type up top, uh, post to S3, string data, handle response, string response, log error string, and save success. And then inside of our uh, case expression, we can actually pull those things out at the same time as we're matching on them. So that's one of the ways that union types are kind of nice. Rather than having to do uh, a specific match on action type and then separately extracting the data one at a time, we can do both at the same time. 
So post to S3, we pull out the path string and the content, handle response, pull out the name string and the response, and then inside each of those, we implement the logic just like we did before. Okay, so union types are one type of parameterized types. Tasks are also parameterized types. So a task has two types. It has an error type and a success type. So in the example that we gave for post to S3, either we're gonna get back an HTTP error, which indicated something like network unavailable, or something went horribly wrong in the course of trying to send this resume to S3, or if it was successful, we'll get back a response, and that response will have the status code that we're gonna check to see if it's 200 or not. Okay, now in JavaScript, you have effects three different ways. There are three ways to run effects in JavaScript. One is synchronous. Uh, you call local storage.foo, that is an asynchronous effect. As Soon as you run that line of code, you will have an effect. Another is asynchronous, so send to S3. Also, when you run that code, you'll have an effect, but the callback won't get invoked until that effect is done. And finally, you have asynchronous via a promise, which is the same thing as a callback, except that you chain things together differently and so forth. So all three of these are very common ways of doing effects in JavaScript. You also have three ways of handling errors in JavaScript. One is exceptions, so you might run a line of code in JavaScript and expect that it might throw an exception, so you do a try-catch around it. Another is that you might run it as a callback, and as we saw in Node.js, it's very common to have the error argument as the first uh, argument to the call callback. So you might get both. You might have a callback and also an exception. You might need to check for both of those. And then, of course, promises have their own built-in notion of success and failure, which interacts in sometimes surprising and fun ways with these other two. As James Long mentioned yesterday, um, Mozilla was having this problem where you were getting exceptions swallowed by promises. They were um, thinking that they were covered by wrapping in things in a try-catch, but in fact, uh, because promises do their own try-catching and translating it into these failure things, uh, it turns out you weren't covered. So this is a, a little bit annoying that you have these different ways of potentially encountering errors. Elm is a little bit more consistent. So whereas you have three different ways to do effects in JS, so synchronous, async via callback, or composable async via promise, and effects in Elm are just one way, composable async via task. That's the only way to do any effect in Elm. There's no synchronous, just calling a thing and not thinking about when, when it might return. There's no callback-based effects. It's all via tasks, and tasks have that same notion of success and error. Also, although there are three different ways to do errors in JavaScript, exceptions, callback error arguments, and promise failures, again, Elm just has one way to do it, task failures. So there's nothing to swallow because there is no try-catch in Elm. If you're trying to figure out how to handle an error in Elm, there's only one way to do it. It's via handling a task failure. We'll see how this gets even more awesome later on. Finally, in JavaScript, all of your effects are side effects. When you run one of those things, the effect happens right now. It's very easy to sneak a side effect back into a function that appears on the surface to be stateless in which all of your tests confirm are stateless, but which turns out not to be because the side effect was introduced. Whereas in Elm, all effects are managed effects. If the only way to get an effect is by returning a task, you can't sneak that into anything. It has to actually suddenly return a task, which means that it's not going to be compatible with what it was doing before. You can't accidentally return something completely different. Managed effects instead of side effects. Okay, so now when we're implementing our run action, and uh, we've got this case expression, we've got post to S3 as our action type, which is now a union type. We're extracting path and content, and then we're calling post to S3. Remember that now, instead of passing a, a callback to that, post to S3 is returning a, t a task. It is now stateless. Post to S3 is going to return a task that's got two uh, types type parameters. One is the HTTP error, which is in case it's got a network failure or something like that, and then the response in case it was successful. And then we can take that response and look at it and figure out if we got a 200 or not. So now this is all totally stateless. Here's all the wiring it takes to make that happen. Port tasks equals app.tasks, that's it. So in Elm, that's how you take all of these tasks, all these values, and turn them into effects. You just hand them off to Elm with this one line of boilerplate. You just say, here you go, runtime. This is a, port is a keyword in Elm. And you say, here are all my tasks. Make them turn into effects magically. And it just does. It's very consistent about that. Okay, <clears throat> why is that cool? So data types in Elm are verified at build time. What does that mean? Here's an example of what that means. If I try to call the negate function, which is the, which is the sign of an integer, and I pass it hamburger, instead of an integer, I will get this error message, type mismatch. The argument to function negate is causing a mismatch. So it's got the little red squiggle under there indicating the offending piece of code. It's got the line number on the left, line nine. So this function negate is expecting the argument to be a number, but it is a string. That's true, you cannot negate a hamburger. I had no idea how you would negate a hamburger. And neither does the compiler. 
Um, this happens at build time, right? So this is not something that gets to runtime and then you have a crash in your browser console. This is something that just happens at the console. It just tells you this. It goes through your program and analyzes everything and it figures out mismatches like this ahead of time. Okay, what does that imply for effects? Well, when effects are data, then those effects can also be verified at build time. What does that mean? So remember that who did that question earlier? It's like somebody, some jerk modified local storage in the middle of something and it turned out to be this count function that had no business touching local storage. Now in Elm, when you're wondering who did that, who was responsible for this bug, when you're trying to narrow down the set of potential culprits and you're looking through, it now gets really easy. Because if you look at parse resume, you're like, yeah, that returns a contact info, not a task. So I know that that couldn't possibly be the, the culprit here. It can't return a task, so it can't possibly have any effects. It is guaranteed to be stateless and effect free. Post S3, on the other hand, is returning a task, and also we can see from its parameterized type what sort of a task it is. It's got an HTTP error and a response object, so we can tell that's probably a network effect. Probably doesn't actually have to do with local storage. And the best part about this is that the compiler is verifying all this at build time. So it's not like parse resume is sometimes returning contact info, sometimes returning something else, maybe sometimes it's sneakily returning a task. Not possible. The compiler makes sure that these are consistent. Parse resume returns contact info, only contact info, every single time. So that means that when you're looking through your code base and you've got this weird bug and you're trying to figure out who caused this effect that broke things, you can narrow down things just by looking at them. You don't have to go through line by line of every function and be like, what did you do? What did you do? What did you do? You just be like, what did you return? Oh, contact info? All right, get out of here. You're not responsible, I know that. And you can just really quickly narrow down the set of potential culprits, cuts out a ton of debugging time. Okay, what does this mean for testing? So, remember this thing? Um, this is our original implementation of the post to S3 action type written in JavaScript. And we were calling post to S3, passing in the data from our actions, the path, the data. We had this callback function, no business logic in here but we still needed this wiring to make sure that things you know, hooked up properly. And we needed to test this with a mock because in the example of what happens if we introduce file size, we needed to make sure that this thing was passing through file size properly. Because even if our business logic functions on both sides were working properly, there was still the possibility that this wasn't passing it through right. Except that was in JavaScript, right? So in Elm, if you look at store resume, it takes a file, returns an action. Handle response takes a string response, returns an action. Okay, the compiler's verifying that these are all correct. These are the arguments that are being passed, they're the correct type, everything is good. If I change those and I introduce an int to handle response, so name, size, and now response, if that's what that's taking now, not only do I have to, I don't need to rely on tests anymore to make sure that that's happening. If I have something that's no longer calling handle response passing the correct signature, in other words, it's calling it passing the old way, I forgot to update that wiring, I'm gonna get a compiler error. So in other words, the wiring can't mess this up. That little function that we wrote that we needed a mock to test in JavaScript can't break this anymore because the compiler will just cover it. If there's a mismatch, if the wiring is wrong, the compiler will tell you about it for sure. You don't need to write a test for that. And we also talked earlier about how of these three functions, the first two were stateless and didn't need any mocks, and the only reason the third one needed any mocks was to test that the wiring worked. Which means, if the compiler's got you covered on the wiring, we don't need any mocks anymore. We can test our whole program as stateless functions without any mocking and still be totally covered. Awesome. So finally, all tests are created easy. We can have this program that we're going to ship to production and no longer feel like we need to cut this corner and just skip the entire effects testing process because it's easy now. It's just as easy as taste, te uh, taste testing, wow, as testing <laughs> the stateless functions. Awesome. Okay, so let's take this a step further. So one of the other things that we saw was that sometimes we were taking an effect and all we, were, all we were doing with that action was we were computing the next action. So we had handle response that was situationally returning one of two next actions to do. Okay, but that's something that we kind of do a lot. As we were, might also recall, post to S3 was returning another action that gets done. So Elm Effects is this library that takes task output and just turns it back into another action, or takes it, 
and uh, it, once you've translated it into another action, feeds it back into run action, so you just get this continuous loop of actions. You don't need to actually do that extra wiring of saying, okay, let's look at what we got back and then call ourselves again with that. This just takes care of all of that stuff for you. Okay, so there's a slight difference here, right? This is a little bit different than what we had before. So we still have run action, we're still doing a pattern match on, on action using our case expression, now we're taking the result of post to S3, which returns a task, and passing it to effects.task. Okay, cool. So post to S3 is a task return, returning an HTTP error and a response. So an HTTP error if there's an error, and a response if there's a success. Uh, that's a problem, though, because we want to send that back into run action, but we can't do that because we've said that ElmFX is going to take the results of that task and feed it back into run action but we didn't actually make it result in another action. Whether it succeeds or fails, it's always returning something that's not an action. So we need to translate it back into an action if we want it to actually be fed back in. So this will be a build error if we run this code. It will say, no, you can't do this, you have a type mismatch, you need to translate that. All right, sure. So one of the nice things about having effects as data is that it's easy to translate from one type of data to another. So you have this function task.map. That second line of code there, that's uh, an anonymous function in Elm. So it's like arrow, using arrows, but uh, instead of the ES6 arrows where you have parentheses around the arguments, you just have a little backslash indicating this is the start of the arguments and then the arrow indicates the end of the arguments. So we could have multiple arguments in there, but in this case, it's just the response. So task.map is responsible for translating the success case into a different type of success. So we're saying, all right, we're gonna get this response object and we're gonna translate that into a handle response action passing the path that we've got from earlier on in the pattern match, and then the response that we got from the task. And then uh, the, the second argument to task.map is the actual task that we're doing this translation on. So what this is gonna give us back is a new task, which if it succeeds, actually gives a handle response action rather than uh, a raw HTTP response. If it's an error, it's still going to be an HTTP error, but if it's a success, it's now an action. Okay, and then finally, we need to handle the error case. Now remember, it said in ElmFX that it needs to get an action out, no matter what, which means that this can't be a task that fails. It needs to always succeed with an action of some sort. So the way that we get a task that never fails is we call task.onError, again passing an anonymous function, and this time uh, onError takes the, uh, the error type and then translates it into a new type of task. So in this case, we're gonna say task.succeed, which gives you back a task that never fails, and one of those actions in there. So in, a, in essence, we've gone from a task that on error gives you an HTTP error and on uh, success gives you back a response object and now on error it gives you a log error success and on success it gives you back a handle request action. So in either case, we're now getting back an action. That's what this means. So error handling has now become impossible to forget. If we'd tried not to handle that error and not translated it back into an action of some sort, we would have gotten a build error. LMFX would have said, no, you can't do this. You're giving me an HTTP error. You forgot to handle that. Turn that into an action. So we turned it into an action. We turned it into a log error action. And if we'd forgotten to do that, we would have gotten a compiler error. What that means is that now error handling is deliberate. It's impossible to forget. The compiler will literally yell at you if you ever forget to handle one of these errors. What's cool about that is that it actually lets you improve user experience very cheaply. So instead of having to be like, wait a minute, did I try catch around that? Did I, okay, wait, was this getting swallowed by that? What happens here? Uh, I'm not sure. If you want to swallow an error, you can do it on purpose. You can make like a no-op action that just does nothing. That's fine. But then it's very clear in your code, explicitly, that's a decision you'd make. It's not a mistake that you potentially didn't step into. It's like, no, okay, I don't think we actually want to ha handle this error. It makes it so much easier to make a nice user experience when you're reminded of error handling, when some error handling is no longer something that you can forget. And so we've benefited from this at No Red Ink, where I work. So we've started using Elm in production, we sort of swapped out React for it, and ever since, there, ever since then, not only has it been that we no longer get runtime exceptions from our Elm code, but in addition, our user experience has actually notably improved because we found these spots where it's very clear that there's a potential error that could impact a user. And instead of just failing to handle it like we used to because there were just so many possible error states, now it's like, oh, it's there, and there, and there. That doesn't sound so bad. So now we actually blog the errors, or even better, display something to the end user if something's unrecoverable. Or if something is recoverable, we can do both. We can log an error and then restore the user to some sort of recovered state and just kind of continue on and give them at least some semblance of a reasonable user experience. 
This is never an experience I've had before of having it where your compiler actually results in a better experience for your end user. But just the fact that it's made things like this easier has definitely had that effect. Okay, so in summary, just combining the two things we looked at previously, here's our new post to S3 implementation. So let is a, a keyword in Elm. Unlike let in JavaScript, let in Elm just means constant. Uh, so you have let and in, and basically everything in between let and in is just scoped to right there. It's very explicit about scope. Uh, so we have our action task, which is how we're mapping the task to turn it, uh, the success into a handle response action. We have our never failing task, which is taking that action task and then uh, mapping it so that we always get a log error in the case of failure. And then we call effects.task passing that. Okay, so we are one step removed from the Elm architecture, which is something that people may have heard. Uh, it's inspired Redux, it's inspired a lot of different things. Um, let me tell you, it definitely works the best in Elm. So, um, <laughs> it's composed of three parts, model, view, and update. So model is just data, it just represents your application state. View takes the model as an argument and just returns uh, a new representation of what you want the UI to look like. So React 0.14 introduced stateless rendering components, that's all Elm's ever had, and that's all Elm needs. They're very simple, it's just a function. There is no component, it's just literally take in the model and then a dispatcher to send actions to and then return a representation of what you want the UI to look like, that's it. Your update function takes the model and then uh, a list of, uh, or sorry, it takes the model and then whatever action you want to apply to that model and then returns a new model as well as whatever effects you want done. Okay, so. Here is run action translated into the Elm architecture. We've now renamed it to update because now it's doing both the effect and the model. So it takes an action and the old model. Case action of, that's the same as before. Post to S3, that's the same as before. Construct our never failing task, as same as before. Except now we're returning something slightly different. Now we're returning a tuple. So a tuple in Elm is basically like a fixed length array in JavaScript. Each position in the tuple can hold different types if you want it to, um, but it's just fixed length. So we're always returning exactly two things and that's enforced at compile time. First thing we're returning is the new model that we want. In this case, we're just returning the same model as before, but if we wanted to change the model and uh, have it updated to a new state, this is exactly where we do it. And then of course, the same thing as before, effects.task. Cool. So this means that now in the Elm architecture, state changes are also isolated and easy to test before and after. You just call your update function, passing your old model, and then it's gonna return a new model in that tuple. You can just look at it and see what the new model was as a result of running that action. Super easy to test. It's just as easy as any other stateless thing to test. You don't need to mock out your stores and see what happens when this gets set or that gets set. No, just call the function. Look at what came out of it. That's it. Okay, and finally we have the view component. This is how views work in the Elm architecture or in Elm HTML. Um, you take two arguments. The dispatcher is what determines where the actions get sent. The model is the current model. And you just render stuff. You just return a representation of what you want the DOM to look like. And then just like React does, you've got this virtual DOM concept where it's going to very efficiently diff this between what it's got now and what it had previously and uh, take care of making the, the minimal set of manual DOM updates necessary to reflect what you've requested on the screen for your end user. So uh, this is a div. We've got a class called upload button. Uh, we've got an on-click handler. We give it the dispatcher that we want to send the action to. Those dispatchers are automatically wired in uh, by a library that makes it so that they end up sending actions to your update function. And then the action we want to send to it is upload resume, which would be a new action we would add to our action union type. And you've got the text in the button that says upload resume. So user interactions are also actions. Effects are actions. So everything we've done here is all using effects as data exactly the same way as we had before. Everything is perfectly stateless and totally easy to test. Okay, so in summary, Elm architecture, you've got raw data, which is your model. Your update is just a function that takes an action and a model and returns a tuple of the new model you want and any effects that you want done in addition to changing that model. And then you've got a view, which takes a dispatcher that points to the, uh, the update function and your old model and just returns HTML that you want the users to view. You all just learned the Elm architecture. Give yourselves a round of applause. That's all there is to it. 
Okay, if you'd like a complete tutorial of uh, building something using this, there's a blog post on our company blog, building a live validated signup form in Elm. Basically starts only assuming that you know JavaScript and takes you from start to finish building a live validated signup form that uses uh, the Elm architecture and all this good stuff and does Ajax and effects and all that. All right, so to sum up, what did this get us? Mock free testing. We can actually write our tests, all of our tests, and test our whole application without writing any mocks at all. It's great. I haven't written any mocks since we started using Elm, and I don't miss them at all. Easier debugging. When we're asking who caused this breakage, who had this effect that we didn't expect, we can really quickly narrow down the set of functions that could have possibly done that. It's only the ones that return tasks. And finally, we have error handling you can never forget. You can no longer have stuff get swallowed and forget to deal with it. It's always very explicit. If you forget, quote unquote, to handle an error, it's because you deliberately made the choice of saying, I want this to go to a no-op action. You can never do it accidentally. So all of this is thanks to effects as data. Thanks very much. Cool. Let's look at some questions. Uh, there's a lot of questions. All right. Four. Okay. <clears throat> we still have like 15 minutes left, so. Sure. All right. What are the frustrations with Elm you aren't sharing with us? Okay. Um, so I would say that uh, I'm a big fan of Elm, obviously, but it's not without drawbacks. Uh, the first drawback is learning curve. So Elm is significantly different than JavaScript. Um, it sort of has to be in order to be significantly better, which I would say it is. Um, the learning curve is, uh, I would say, pretty easy to get to overcome, uh, to get sort of like minimally productive. Um, the, the, the example I can give of that is that we had someone, her uh, previous programming experience was she did three months at a JavaScript boot camp. Before that, was not a programmer. And uh, this was, she came to us, this was her first programming job. And in her first week, she was writing production Elm. So it's definitely doable. Um, but having said that, getting over that hump from like being able to be productive versus being you know, confident in it and comfortable with it, it takes a while because you have a lot of things to relearn. There are things where you're used to doing it one way with JavaScript with side effects and you go to reach for that in Elm and it doesn't work because there are no side effects. And you have this moment where you're like, this, this isn't possible. I can't do what I need to do. And it turns out you can. There's just a different way of doing it that you're not used to yet. So certainly one of my early frustrations was I just had to relearn this toolbox. I had this series of things where I would reach for and they wouldn't be there and I had to learn how to reach for the new thing. Um, and I think that's more true there in Elm than you would uh, find in other languages like ClojureScript and things, which have um, some of these functional ideas but which don't take them as far and as a consequence um, you don't have as much to relearn. Um, that would be the biggest thing. The other frustration is um, that, again, because Elm is really serious about its guarantees, the way that it interoperates with JavaScript is using this port system. Uh, so ports basically treat JavaScript like a client-server relationship. So instead of sharing code, you just call it passing data and then get data back from it, like a pub-sub system. Um, what that means is that, whereas, again, I'm going to use ClojureScript because it's another functional language, um, in ClojureScript, you can just share code with JavaScript. You can just say, I want to take this JavaScript function, I want to just call it. In Elm, you can't do that. In Elm, what you have to do is you have to set up sort of a client-server relationship with your JavaScript code, and then all of that gets isolated. So the upside of that is that your Elm code no longer has to worry about, you know, all these guarantees stay in place, but the downside is that now, literally any time you want to interoperate with a JavaScript API, it's as much work as talking to the server. You have to send data to it, and it gets, gives you data back. Sometimes that data might be crazy. You have to deal with that. Um, so that's more work, and that, that was sort of like initially frustrating to um, deal with, but now that I've gotten used to it, honestly, it's, it's really not bad because we don't really use that many. I think we use, we use a date picker, uh, like a jQuery date picker. We use a, um, a lunar.js for full text indexing, Algolia, and Rollbar for error reporting. And so those are like the only things that we actually interoperate with as far as JavaScript libraries. So for each of those, we have a port system that, where we talk to it. Um, a little bit frustrating, but uh, overall, I'd say it's worth it. Um, I think that's, those are the two main ones. Uh, maybe there's something else I'm not thinking of, but hit me up on Twitter and I'll elaborate, I guess. <laughs> uh, all right, other questions. Um, how often do you find yourself writing code just to satisfy the compiler? Writing code just to satisfy the compiler? Um, basically never. Uh, so Elm has type inference. I'm, I'm assuming where this question is going um, is basically the frustration I used to have as a Java programmer. So like, uh, I used to be a professional Java developer and I hated it and I left it. And uh, one of the things I hated most about it was that you had to write out your types for every damn thing. So you had to be like, 
this is a string, and this is an int, and this is a list of a thing of a thing. And every single time, it was really annoying. Um, so Elm, you don't have to do that. And uh, so actually, you may have noticed that on none of my slides that I annotate anything with types. Um, in practice, I actually like to annotate things with types uh, in, in particular places, just because of that debugging experience that I got previously. So uh, in a lot of cases, if I'm debugging, it's really nice to be able to scan through my code and be like, okay, wait, who returns what? Uh, you don't return a task and you don't, and just having that one little line tells me that and it helps you narrow things down faster. But it's an optional form of documentation. The compiler will just infer things for you, um, if, you, uh, if, you if you don't annotate them. Um, as far as how often do I find myself writing code to do that, so almost never, how often do I find myself changing code just to satisfy the compiler all the time, but that's because I screwed up um, and the compiler is saving me and I'm making the change because if I didn't make the change and it weren't compiled language, it would have blown up at runtime. So I definitely don't regret that time spent. Um, okay, what about type systems for JavaScript? Can we add types gradually to an existing language without switching to a new one and have similar guarantees? Um, to an extent, yeah. I mean, so you can have like TypeScript and Flow. Um, certainly you can get better type safety out of those. Um, but I think kind of the, the point of this talk, right, is effects as data. And obviously you get a completely different set of guarantees when you don't have side effects. Every single one of those languages has side effects. So you can get type checking, you can get that part where the wiring is now guaranteed to be correct, where things are passing the right thing to other things, but unless you actually have effects as data as this first class notion of the language, you still can't get the same debugging experience, you still can't get the same easy testing experience, and none of those languages are ever gonna have that. What's the best way to start with Elm? Official site, any particular book slash blog slash tutorial? Sure, um, so the official site has a number of things. Um, I think for this crowd, if you're all coming from a JavaScript background, I would recommend that blog post, um, building a live validated sign up form in Elm, just because it starts with JavaScript and gets you to building your first thing. I've also heard really good things about Mike Clark's Pragmatic Studio tutorials on Elm. People have said those are really good. I haven't actually watched them, but I've, I've heard extremely good things. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say start with those two. Uh, also, again, hit me up on Twitter if you have questions because I'm reflexive about answering questions. <laughs> um, okay, Elm looks powerful and promising, but it seems to be very young, sure. Uh, should this be a concern? How is the infrastructure around it these days? Um, yeah, Elm is definitely young. Uh, should it be a concern? I guess is uh, up to you. Um, so from my perspective, the Elm code that we've written is basically the most reliable code on our site. Um, switching back from Elm to JavaScript would definitely be the risky thing to do. Like that would definitely make our code base less reliable. Um, Elm is just very reliable. Uh, it is young. I would say the main consequence of it being young is just that the library ecosystem is less mature. So. Fortunately, we do have the port system. We can interoperate with JavaScript libraries, so pretty much everything that we've run into where we're like, this doesn't exist in Elm yet, we just fall back on using the version in JavaScript, which has led to this kind of weird dynamic where like, we had this assignment form. It's like thousands of lines of code. It's really complicated. It does a lot of stuff, and everybody on the team will tell you the same thing that they swear about is this damn jQuery date picker that we interoperate with. All the Elm code with all this massive complexity is fine, but it's like that date picker, like, when does it throw these events? What is it doing? Who designed this thing? It's really annoying. We, we've definitely thought about, we, initially we were like, we're not gonna rewrite our own date picker. Who does that? And then we were like, oh, we're getting closer and closer every day. It's like it has like a few UX things that most date pickers don't have that we want. And we're just like this close to just rewriting it in Elm because we just can't stand all the errors we get from it. Really annoying. Um, anyway, so Elm is young, library ecosystem, not nearly as big as JavaScript, obviously, but you can still fall back on JavaScript for, is so far, everything that we've needed. Um, how do you do logging? That's clearly a side effect. Yes, definitely. So that was one of the four things that I mentioned. Um, Rollbar. So Rollbar is uh, basically one of those services where you send it logging events and then it records them on a server. So that's our, our most common port by far is talking to Rollbar. So whenever we have uh, one of our actions that's basically in every single one of our update functions is called record error and it just describes what you want sent to Rollbar and then we have that wired up to automatically send to Rollbar. So it's a very common thing for us to do is we'll write something like let's say we're going to do an Ajax thing. Um, we will either on success have an action that processes the success or on error we will give it one of those record error actions and it'll send it out to Rollbar. So it's actually really nice and readable because you basically see like literally, okay, on success, here's what we're gonna do and on error, we're gonna record it to Rollbar. So we're really confident that if that breaks in an unexpected way, it's gonna get sent off to Rollbar. Um, okay, uh, is it possible to render ELM app on server? So Elm is, I don't know why, I guess there's something called ELM, but like Elm is not all caps. I mean, I guess I could be like loud about it, Elm. Um, but 
just, just a note, I see that a lot. Uh, is it possible to render it on a server? Uh, so in other words, um, universal, I'm not gonna use the other word for that, but universal rendering. Um, uh, no, nobody's done that yet. Uh, it's really easy, it's just that basically nobody in the community has like gotten around to it yet. If someone wants to contribute that, that would be awesome. It's definitely technically feasible and easy to do, it's just no one's done it yet. Um, same thing with React Native is another thing we get asked about a lot. Does Elm compile to React Native? Not yet, but again, it's just because nobody, actually that one's more of a knowledge gap where there, I don't think there's anybody in the Elm community who's used React Native enough to be able to do those bindings properly, but it'd be great if somebody could because that would be really excellent. Um, <clears throat> Do you run into any problems slash milestones when developing with Elm? Or limitations, sorry, when developing with Elm? Um, besides having to think in a different paradigm. Um, problems or limitations? Uh, not that I, can, I mean, really it is just thinking in a different paradigm. We certainly haven't run into anything that we couldn't express in Elm, um, or at least, you know, use a port. I will say, okay, so a limitation would be that in some cases, you run into these very weird corner cases where you want to do something weird, like you want to just like do some hack where you want to just mutate something and just like, you know it's a, like kind of a horrible hack, but that's just like the best tool for this job. Um, and then basically what you end up doing is you write a port and then the port does, rather than calling out to some JavaScript library, calls out to your little hack and, uh, and you've just got this one little like three line JavaScript function that's mutating like window dot something and you're just kind of like, let us never speak of this again. Um, but it works, uh, you know, it, it gets the job done. So uh, I, generally speaking, whenever we've run into problems or limitations, that's what we'll do. Um, but that's been extremely infrequent. Like basically overall the experience has just been, we write a lot of Elm code, it's really nice, it's really, you know, reliable, and then we have a tiny little bit of, uh, you know, calling out to JavaScript libraries or calling out to a little hack. Um, okay, uh, most of the actions in Flux consist of beginning, success, failure. A tuple in Elm, it seems to be good at encapsulating that with tasks, but can we do that in JS? Yeah, um, certainly. I mean, uh, using the same techniques that I talked about in the first half of the presentation, you can absolutely do the same effects as data conceptual stuff in JavaScript. Um, it's just that you don't get the same guarantees. Really, uh, so I would argue that what effects as data gets you as a concept is improved testabil uh, testability, and what it gets you from Elm is once you've already adopted that model as the first class thing that you're building your language around, in addition to testability, you get all of these other benefits. And the cost, of course, is having to learn to think in that way. Let's do one more. One more. Okay. Um, does it take longer to develop an Elm versus J, oh, this is a great question, versus JS and React, et cetera, or is it a myth about, okay, uh, about strong typing? Yeah, so this is exactly what it's like. We, we've talked about this on our team, and this is exactly what it feels like. So let's say you're building a feature out over the course of like three months. In the first like two or three weeks, building it in Elm is gonna be slower than building it in JavaScript or you know, React would have been. Definitely the initial time, like, it's, it's making your stuff more reliable by making you handle all of these error cases and things and like preventing you from forgetting that. And in JavaScript, you, you're allowed to forget those things. And you can just write the code and not have to write the code to handle those errors and things like that. So the first like two or three weeks, definitely JavaScript is the win. And if you're, honestly, if I'm building a new prototype and I'm just hacking it together and I'm not gonna like keep it around and maintain it, I won't write it in Elm, I will write it in JavaScript. I'll use it right in jQuery, honestly. I'll just be like, slap it together, be like, whatever the fastest thing to get a prototype on the screen so we can do user testing, that's what I'll do. Um, if we want it to be maintained, I'll always reach for Elm because over the course of those three months, it's not even close. Like we will spend way less time on Elm, like building out that feature over the course of three months than we would in JavaScript. Like I don't even have to think about that. I know what the answer is. So if you've got a really short time frame, you're just banging out a prototype, use JavaScript. If you're writing something that's gonna be maintained over the long term, Elm will definitely save you time. Thanks. Thank you, thank you so much.